Bryn did not like my song choice today. I just want to make that clear. That was all me. There we go. Me invite you, Kevin. Let's see. It should send and just hit yes. Lay down, Marie. Lay down. Ah. There we are. All right, this will work on my phone, I guess. It's probably going to be easier than my cell phone or my, my laptop. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. It's a little quiet. All right, let me try some. Uh, give me a sec. Let me try some earbuds. Is that, is that better? Yeah, yeah, it's good. It's good. Just talk loud, as loud as you can, I think. It's just... Yeah, it's okay. Thing. Yeah, all right, all, right. all right. How's that? Perfect. Thank you for coming on. No worries. It's a yeah, perfect thanks. time right now, you know, with everything going on with uh, Phylos, the fallout from all that. I know people have a lot of questions for, uh, for other companies in the industry. They're looking, they're looking for, for someone that they can trust, obviously. That's, that's been the right, issue. Right, right. Okay, so I would say that in general, um, don't trust me there because you go. trust trust is what has gotten us where we are, yep. and I think you should look at people's actions. Um, yeah, we we saw this coming many years ago, and it happens in every like genomics industry I've been in. People start up a company, they offer a very low cost test to entice people to submit, they harvest that data, it turns into surveillance capitalism, and then they run off and, and make a database. <laughs> All of that is, is fine, I think, if you're forward with that and if yeah. that's the stated intent. And I, I don't think anyone on this thread is arguing that no one has a right to breed. Everyone has a right to grow this plant. Absolutely. They have a right to go and breed. I think yep. it is the concern on the table is did you have uh, you know, a notorious intent? Did you deceive people in the process of doing this? And I Absolutely. think that's probably where most of the uproar is. So how – you know, how will we not deceive people? Well, don't trust us. Look at our actions is what I'd say. Since 2016, um, when we saw this coming, we realized, all right, we got to build an antidote. And the best antidotes to this are to enable point of grow testing. So people yeah. don't have to hand over their DNA. So we've been building those tools for the last few years. Um, if folks aren't familiar with them, they're, they're on our website. There's a, now there's a variety of people that actually run them as a service. We, we don't run ser that, that service here because we we're not comfortable shipping stuff across state lines. Sure. Um, the Farm Bill has made changes that little bit. We're still trying to get our head around that. But we do accept um, stem samples that can go in the mail if they're, if they're non-viable. That's the gotcha. ruling from hemp industry associations versus the DA. You can't have viable stuff. So you have to isopropanol treat them. I think Phylos is doing the same thing, and I, I don't know whether their stuff is viable or not. The, uh, I don't think that's the real issue at hand. It's that they have your genomic DNA, and they can do a lot with that. Yeah. Um, the leaf smears, our lawyers wouldn't let us put those in the mail because they claim people could tissue culture them. And I, I'm, I've never I've, – I've done cell culture. I've not done cannabis tissue culture, so I don't know if that's true or not. We just weren't allowed to do it. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't, I think that's a very thin chance unless people have given them tissue and seeds that they're actually doing that. I think the real, I think it's a bit of a red herring when they say, uh, we can resurrect or Jurassic park your, your, your strain from DNA. That's partially true. What they can do, uh, is they can take your genomic DNA, amplify certain regions of it and transform it into other plants. And that's exactly. not hard. Yeah. Uh, in fact, we saw that happen with Jay Kiesling. He actually amplified out all the cannabinoid pathway and put it into yeast. Uh, and he wow. did this pretty quickly. Uh, when you consider how long a lot of the other companies have been trying to get THC expressing in yeast, the Kiesling lab came up by, took everyone by storm and did this uh, very quickly. Um, John Page did this too. He, he got cannabichromine into yeast and, and showed that in the most recent Lafferty paper. So um, the cannabinoid genes are very small, they're very easy to clone, and they're very portable. Uh, so it's possible they can, they can scan through all the genomic DNA that they've got and say, all right, these strains make THCV, these ones make that, we should clone mm -hmm. a couple of these genes into other plants and see what happens. So the genomic DNA, I think, is the real crux. They have that, and to the extent that they're turning and using that against uh, the manner in which they sold people to submit it in, um, you know, that goes against... Uh, that doesn't help that they had that, that really broad data release policy because that probably gives them an out to do that. Oh, yeah, it does. Uh, but it's certainly, um, it's certainly challengeable, I think, because it was done under false pretense. Um, oh, yeah. There's even some posts we've seen where they've claimed that uh, they 
uh, they use when people press them on what are your methods, they say, oh, we use the same methods in the Human Genome Project. Well, that's blatantly false, and I can attest to that in the court of law that those aren't the methods they used, and you can tell that by what they submitted in the NCBI. The sequencers they used didn't even exist back in 1999. So yeah. um, that that's a clear stretch, and so there's false advertising going on, and I think that's where. Uh, where a lot of the attention should, I think, should be placed. Um, the other thing we did outside of trying to decentralize the testing so people could do it at the grow, the sequencers aren't quite point of grow yet. They, they may be in like two or three years with these nanopores, but they're still a little noisy and hard to use. So if people are still submitting samples in, uh, we think you shouldn't trust us. You should assume one day we're going to get either pushed out of business, uh, you know, step on the wrong law, the federal law, and get in trouble, or that we're, uh, or Monsanto, let's say the worst case scenario, Monsanto comes and buys us. Yeah. What are we gonna do then? Uh, so what we've tried to do is make sure the record of the timestamps of your material are not in our control and not in anyone's control, whoever owns our business. And the way we do that is we take your sequence and create a hash of it. It's not the whole sequence, it's just a hash. This is a, mm -hmm. a, a it's what's known as a unidirectional hash function. So your sequence file turns into gibberish, but it, turns, it always turns into that gibberish that fingerprint when you run a program called SHA-256. It makes a cryptographic hash out of your data. Whenever you present that algorithm with your DNA file, it will make that same hash. You can't go from the hash back to the sequence though. Uh, that's gotcha. impossible. So we put that hash in a blockchain transaction uh, so that it's globally distributed on a public ledger with a timestamp on it that no one in the world can change. So if we disappear and you still have your DNA file, you can prove that my sample existed at this particular time. Um, and we put that in place from day one on Canopedia back in probably 2014 or so. Long, long before we saw this risk happening, we just knew that was, that was the right thing to do. Um, uh, so th those are two things that, that we're trying to do is, is we're, we're actively building business components that enable point of grow testing as opposed to um, trying to hoard those assays for ourselves to run them for breeding. Uh, and, and those actions, I think, speak for themselves. You can see, um, I mean, Seth Crawford has a CBG line out there now. Uh, because he used some portable tools. He used orange photonics to look for CBG in our, in our UPCR assay. So to the extent that we're ever going to harvest information out of a database, our intent is to turn that into a test the growers can buy and use themselves, not yeah. that we would keep that private and use it as some advantage to breed. We've never bred before. We're, the, the, we're not, it's not our comfort zone. We've always built, if you look at our history, we've always built genetic assay tools. That's our sweet spot. That's where we want to stay, and we actually think that's a very attractive market, that if we can build tools that all the breeders can use, uh, there's plenty of, uh, of uh, upside to go around. Oh, sure. Yeah, that's, that's massive in itself. Yeah, so I, I mean, I hope that's compelling. Uh, I can tell you and attest to the fact that every assay we've built to date, we have all privately funded. But that doesn't mean we wouldn't find something. I can't predict the future. Maybe we find some marker in the data that's in Canopedia and that turns into a test people can buy. But it won't turn into a proprietary advantage for us to go and compete with the customers. That's not our, our model. In fact, yeah. I think that's a very dangerous model. When you, when you look at businesses, whenever you polarize your investors against your customers, your end net result is a lawsuit. Yeah. And so it's not a healthy practice to do. You've got to find synergy between your investors and your customers to make this work. And if you can't do that, um, you're, I, I think you're in for a world of hurt. Yeah. They, yeah, I think, I think the main issue with Phylos that, you know, some people don't quite understand what's going on and they just hear, um, they, they assume they're stealing genetics and I don't know if they think they're going into people's grows, like, you know, pocketing shit and that's not what's going I, on. Yeah. I've, I've you not heard any of that. And, and I, I can't support any speculation. I'm, I'm certain, you know, our lawyers have told us, like, you can only stick to facts or you'll get libelous claims. And yep. uh, I can only talk about the, the, the facts that um, a few people have provided. Uh, I mean, we didn't even chime into this until it was three days late because we felt it wasn't our place to. And then once we saw there's enough evidence that others presented, uh, yeah. we can confirm it. But um, it wasn't our place to snowball this. Yeah, for sure. And, and I think they did that themselves by first, you know, going to breeders like me and saying, we're never, ever going to breed. We're never, we do not have a tissue culture lab. We will never participate in this. And then they went and did that and then came back and called me a liar, which, which at that point I was like, wait a minute. Now, now you're, now you're. Yeah, yeah, it. yeah. That's, that's, you know, yeah. Reputation is everything. So uh, does anyone have that in writing? That's, that's the, the. They, 
they delivered it all all verbally over the phone, stuff like that. I don't know anybody that has it in writing, and that was what was dangerous. Yeah. Well, um, it's hard to know what's real now. We've seen um, a lot of double talk, so it's very hard to look through what they've said and what they've presented to know what is true and what's not true. I, I do know some things that they're putting on paper aren't real, and that's a different concern. But the, the, the information they're putting forward to investors – uh, is is not 100% true. I mean, they've gone out, the videos at least suggested that they have some exclusive right to Illumina tools. And I know Illumina really well. I mean, they tried to purchase one of our companies in 2008. And I know the CEO, Jay Flatley, really well. He's since retired. But um, uh, those people are, are all in the same circle that I've been in since 1996. And uh, I rang them up and said, hey, what is this? This is the first exclusive license I've ever seen you do. And that it's a, it's a running joke in the genomics field that I got an exclusive from Illumina because you can't. These guys have a near monopoly in the space. They never give out exclusives. So I rang them up like, did, did you guys give one out in cannabis? I'm curious. And they yeah. said, no, send us all the information. It's going straight to legal. We're going to put an end to that. Uh, so if he's out there presenting stuff to investors and he has an exclusive, he needs to clarify that because it, it, he, it's probably true he has his own chip, like a 50,000 case SNP array that they designed. Uh, yeah. It's their SNPs, but there's like 40 million to choose from in the genome and you can easily make a different one, change one SNP and it's a new chip and Illumina doesn't police that and they can't. Their position is we'll make anybody a chip and they've offered to make us one as well. Um, we're looking at it, but it's the economies of it don't look as good as sequencing to us right now. So we're sticking with a uh, sequencing approach, but um, you know, that's something that I think is a little bit, um, maybe he didn't have the time to fully explore that or explain that with, you know, on the stage and investors where there aren't, people being able to probe him about the details of that exclusive, but that's, that's not completely true. And then there's others on there that um, are listed as collaborators of theirs on various of their, of their scientific um, presentations that we've, that we know very well. And we've rung them up saying, is this your, are you really in bed with these guys? And the answer has been no, so please send it to us and we're going to send it to legal and straighten this out. We don't want to be misrepresented in the cannabis industry. So, there, there's, there's things on paper that aren't real, and what they're saying I can't discern because they seem to be giving a completely different story to customers than they are to investors, and Absolutely. that leaves us somewhat, okay, what's true, what isn't true? Uh, it becomes very speculative. Well, let's get you some questions. I know there's, there's 177 people in here right now. I don't know if you can All right. that. <laughs> That's crazy, man. That's great. Um, so first question from uh, Strainly says, Kevin, what prevents MG Medicinal Genomics from selling the data you would have acquired through, te through the tests from your customers? It would be very complicated to demonstrate if you did. Um, that's probably true. We haven't sold any database licenses today. Um, we have had various synthetic biology companies come and ask us if there's anything valuable in the data. And unfortunately, our answer has been we put it, most of it public. So it's uh, the Jamaican lion genome we put public in 60 days. Uh, and then a lot of the Canopedia stuff you'll see, we put public immediately and blockchain hash it. So um, it's hard to sell something when a lot of it's online. Yeah. Uh, what you're seeing uh, with Phylos is very different, though. They, they claimed they were going to be putting this stuff public to give yes. you guys prior art protections, but they were actually hoarding it for two years at a time. Yeah. Um, so they did have the capacity to go and sell it to other people because it hadn't been necessarily revealed. Um, so we, we've not entered into those arrangements. I can't say that that would never happen in the future, but what we do have are um, two different layers of data release policies right now, and we're probably going to add a third after this whole mess just to add a category where people can put data into our database and it can never be used for other analyses. Right now there's a public option where your data goes public and the whole world can use it. Um, I'd point you actually to, there's been seven papers published off of Canopedia data that we're not authors on, that people just scraped the data and reanalyzed it and published a paper on it. Uh, Philippe Prendu sent a few of these. I think uh, um, uh, there's a few, I'll have, to, I'll have to list them afterwards. I can't recall them off name, offhand, but um, people are grabbing that data and publishing uh, work on it. And there's probably people grabbing it and not publishing work on it and keeping it sure. to themselves. There's a class of, of um, customers that want to keep it all private. Um, the only challenge we have in, uh, in the privacy event is that we do need to compare it to everybody else's data in order to deliver the product. So if they want to know if the, if the sample is, excuse me, if the sample is related to anything else in the database, well, it's hard to have that data not compare it to everything else um, yeah. and, still, and still deliver the relationships, right? Um, 
we're now realizing we need one more tier where fine, you can do that. You can compare it to everything else and tell us the relationships, but we don't want you to then go and sell it to somebody else. We want that to remain private. So we need another, another tier after what we've seen here. Um, I can say that probably, uh, uh, this is a rough guess, but probably 70% of the data is already public and only probably 30% of the people opt to keep it private. And they usually convert it to public once they, once they talk to more people and get more legal opinions on, on what they should do. Um, so it, it's, it's a rare case where people are um, keeping everything entirely private. I think um, one of the biggest flaws I saw from the beginning of Phylos was that they, they were uh, crowdsourcing data for their legacy strains, what they called their legacy strains, meaning like, let's say, for example, Chem 91, the original Chem 91 strain, they figured yeah. the more people that submit it, the more likely it is to be the original strain when in fact in cannabis, that's not how shit works. Usually yeah, the less right. people have the original. Um, what, do you use the same method? Uh, well, we, we, we've been reluctant to police the oral history. So what we have, all we do is present your relationships and you do see clusters of like blue dreams that are all next to each other and other ones that aren't. And, and yeah. people just make their, their assumptions is what they are. We have been reluctant to enable people to edit the names that they send in. And that's a big debate in the company, whether we should. And if we do do that, how do we record that history? Because um, what, what can happen in a scenario like this is uh, if you allow people to edit the name after they see where it lines up to everything in the galaxy, you tend to get a bias toward the samples that seeded the galaxy or seeded yeah. Canopedia. Uh, people start to see that, oh, look, I'm, I, I thought it was OG, but I'm not in the OG cluster. I must have mixed something up. It's, it's, it's Blue Dream. Let me rename that one in the galaxy so I don't look like an oddball in the galaxy. Yeah. That creates, I think, uh, a real mess, particularly if if the data that is, that is um, deriving these relationships is questionable, yeah. uh, this becomes a chaos generator in the nomenclature system of cannabis. Yeah. Uh, and I do think it's questionable. We've downloaded their data. Um, and when we try to run their data through tools, uh, it throws a lot of it out. In fact, it throws all of it out. Now, you can force it through uh, <laughs> because we, we know why it throws it out. So um, this gets in the weeds a little bit. But in, in the, the best tools for doing sequencing QC come out of the Broad Institute in Cambridge. Uh, Broad Institute MIT runs this, has this program. It's open source. It's called GATK, Genome Analysis Toolkit. And you take sequencing data and you run it through here and it screens it from the, the crap that creates bad calls. Uh, and the one thing it does not like to see are single PCR amplicons covering a variant because uh, a single PCR amplification event could get the maternal allele or the paternal allele and miss one or the other. Uh, and so it wants to see at least two different molecules calling a variant. That way it knows you've surveyed both alleles, the yeah. maternal and the paternal line. If you only have one, you don't know whether you've surveyed both. So it has a program in there called Picard that rips anything out that has only a single amplicon. And the entire phylos assay design has got a single amplicon covering allele. Now, the Broad wrote this because they sequence human genomes, lots of human genomes, other things, but humans have been their, mainly their focus. Uh, and human genomes, this problem is tenfold less problematic. Uh, we have a variant human to human, one every thousand letters. In cannabis, it's one every 94 letters. So when there's that many variants in the genome, and you're trying to design PCR primers to amplify one of the variants, what often happens is you put these primers on top of other variants you don't know about, and therefore you artificially amplify what your reference was, what you thought you were going to sequence from, let's say, they probably designed it off a of canatonic because they have a nice canatonic reference. Yeah. Um, so in their design, they may have designed these primers so that they fall on these variants, they amplify only the mother line and not the father line, and they get, a, they get a skewed tree. Now, you present the community with these skewed trees without any peer review on the methods, you start calling it certifications, and you enable people to edit the actual names of the strains, and you have a shit show in your hands. Oh, yeah. Uh, and so I, I don't believe anything that comes out of that system because the methods behind it have never made it through peer review, and I don't think they will because there's many papers that have been published warning against doing this exact thing. Uh, that you really cannot do single amplicon variants and you really shouldn't do it in polymorphic genomes because you're going to get all types of reference bias when you do this. Um, I, so I think that's the reason why their methods aren't peer reviewed. All the other parties who have arguably been working off of less funding than they have, have gotten papers out. You've seen Nolan Kane published one. We submitted some data to that paper. Steve Hill put data in there. Mary Jean put data in there. Um, you've seen Philippe Henry put some things out. You've seen Anandia publishes all the time on their methods. Um, almost every other genetic provider out there has their methods published. Um, Soiler's another one. 
Um, and, and so you can review whether or not there's any artifacts going on in the data. Um, so uh, this leads me to what I'm most concerned about is that why did they hold the data back um, and for, for so long? Were they that understaffed that they couldn't put the data public? I don't think so. Um, it takes about, a, it is hard to put data in NCBI. It can take a whole day to, to, to have a bioinformatics person get burnt up putting that data into NCBI, but it doesn't take two years. Yeah. Um, and uh, what else, what other data do they have? I mean, they, 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 they're they talking about a 50K um, SNP array from Illumina quite publicly. Uh, well, their assay only sequenced a couple thousand SNPs, one to 2,000. So how did they design the 50K SNP array if they were only surveying 2,000 SNPs in everyone's samples they sent in? Where did they design the other 48,000 from? Well, they probably had to sequence more territory in everyone's sample to intelligently design that chip or the, the chip is unintelligently designed and it's, it's, it's perhaps not a very good breeding tool. One of those two things is true. Um, so it, it, it does lead you to question, how much have they been putting public and how much have they been keeping private and what type of advantage does it necessarily give them in a breeding program? Those are you know, open questions I don't think anyone has the answer to. That's a, those are actually really good questions to ask. Um, here's another one for you. Kevin, will the, okay, this is a great, a great broad question, but it's, it's very applicable. Kevin, will this data hurt or help cannabis in the long term, in your opinion? Um, the, the whole, not necessarily phyloses, what they're doing, but overall, the, the breeding using these tools, using these tools in general? I think the tools will help. I do think we need um, a chapter out of uh, the crypto space here of decentralizing. Yeah. Putting all of the data in one honeypot database where, let's be frank, the security policy there was not very good. I mean, this was, I don't know if people have seen the threads, but it, bur it was burping out admin password uh, throughout the years. So, you know, we got it and we're their competitor. Yeah. We're the last people that should get their admin password, but it ended up on our screen one day. So that means you have a, a collection of everyone's data where the customers have, don't get to see the data for two years, but the people who got that admin password probably did. Uh, so that's the worst possible scenario for getting uh, a prior that's art crazy. is you held it from the people who paid you for it and yet you were sloppy with the keys and let other people get in. Um, that is that not a prior art system. One. Yes. Is that the autoflower one? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That, that I, I didn't quite recognize that password until I went back and looked at that after all this went down. I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> let me look at that email. Oh my God. <laughs> so yeah, for those who don't know, the the password that it burped out, I don't know if it's a real password or not. And this was many years ago, and I never put this stuff public because it's, it's, it's bad policy to put someone else's yeah. passwords public. Sure. But it was been two years, and I gave it to Mowgli privately, and I'm assuming he went and changed all those things the next day when he realized his competitor had it. Um, yeah. If he didn't, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, but that's a bad policy for you not to change it after I, 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 I tell you what it is. But um, in that list was the password was autoflower allele. And I think someone else in the thread, it may have been some grown um, mids pointed out that it's, the username was forge, like forgery. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like, those are bad names. Uh, yeah, you know? not great names. Um, so it, when they say we weren't looking for anything in your data, I mean, yeah, that would have, you may have, Helen Keller would have been a better name, you know, not autoflower allele. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that was pretty revealing. Yeah. Um, but again, that's speculative. I don't want to get involved in too much speculation, sure, but sure. Uh, I don't think I need to speculate because the videos that were put out pretty much show the Jekyll and Hyde of this, right? There's the investor side of the story, which this data is extraordinarily valuable. We're going to rule the world. And then there's the customer side saying the data is all garbage. Don't worry about it. Uh, those two, uh, you can't square that circle very easily. And I think that video does, uh, you know, it, it is basically the nail in the coffin. Yeah, um, I, that's that's the one thing I've been saying this whole time. You know, people come to me for dirt on Phylos or whatever because I've been I've been researching them for a long time and have had it out with them several times. But the, the fact of the matter is, I, I don't even have to say anything from my opinion. I just show what they say, and that's it. And that's where I've left it. And I think that's been damaging enough. You know. Yeah. Unfortunately, I mean, it would have been nice to have everything on the up and up from the beginning. I, that that would have been ideal, but it's not. It's not necessarily the case. Um, I like what you're saying about decentralization. Obviously, that's that's the goal for, for having a company that's successful. Yeah, I mean, so there's maybe two things to consider is, um, you know, 
I've seen a lot of growers like that are early on and they don't want to buy all their own sequencers yet. And that, you know, they're either outsourced to us or other people. And some will even go to their, their local universities uh, because it's unlikely university is going to turn around and breed on you. Right. And so yeah. they'll get the university. So we're trying to build tools that some of the universities could run that way. You know, we're not necessarily the data hoarding risk that people may consider because we understand after this went down, no one's going to trust anybody to sequence their stuff. I mean, but we hope we can convince you that these blockchains work. But half the time when we tell people about blockchains, their eyes glaze over and say, I don't get it, go away. Uh, so we understand that's not going to satisfy everybody. And uh, so we're going to start building tools that may assist universities to be able to sequence for you. Because frankly, they're going to have a big learning curve. If you went to one today and said, here's my DNA, they're, they're, they're going to stumble on whether they can take it in or not or whether it violates any of their federal grants. Uh, once they get past that hurdle, they're going to they're going to be stumbling on the fact they've never sequenced this genome before, and it's very hard to sequence. And we have a lot of that worked out in, in the kits where they could run these kits onto their sequencers and get data that's very similar to other data that's been that's been made before, and then they could compare it. Excuse me, to Canopedia data. The biggest challenge we've had in PT testing in cannabis genomics is that for the first few years of this, every service provider was running, was sequencing a different part of the genome. So it's really difficult to cross compare everyone's data because you're not covering, you're not sequencing the same bases. Yeah. Um, about two years ago, we changed that and we downloaded the Phylos data, we downloaded the Cane data and the Soiler data, and then we built a panel that covers at least 50 SNPs and all of those things so that we could try to triangulate, um, you know, if you sequence on our panel, you can figure out what it's closest to in all the other data sets. Um, but we need more of that. And so we're, um, we're looking into ways to enable a lot of the other universities to pick this up. That way it's, it's somewhat decentralized. If you don't like the university in your state, maybe you, you send it to another one and, and then it doesn't become this surveillance capitalism approach. Uh, and most other markets, sequencing is very commoditized. There isn't this, um, this window for someone to do this because you can shop around for sequencing providers and, and therefore they don't get to collect large hordes of your data. You can send one strain to one place and one to another and one to another. And, and, and uh, this means the, the aggregation of that data doesn't fall into one person's hands who can be co-opted to sell it to a party you're not, you're not thrilled with. Um, that, that does lead me to a couple points people should be aware of. This the sequencing test that the people have been running at Phylos is the most expensive sequencing per base, I think, of any test in the world. You're only getting 300,000 letters out of this for about $285. To put that in perspective, uh, and you might get 2,000 SNPs, 1 to 2,000 SNPs. The 23andMe test you get for like 99 bucks are surveying 1 to like 5 million SNPs. Wow. Right. So there is this is a complete ride when it comes to sequencing um, costs. Uh, even the, the, the yeah. tests that we run are sequencing uh, 10 times, more than 10 times the territory of the Phylos test for nearly the same price. Um, so there's a, a very heavy price that's being paid to give them your data. Yeah, and, and you're giving them data to potentially be sold is what it looks like. It's the, yeah, and, and the data they're putting public I don't think is very valuable. It's really the fact that they have the genomic DNA. They've got presentations out that are public now that demonstrate them uh, cherry picking 99 samples out of the galaxy. Uh, they have this structure thing that tells you whether it's like Barry or, or uh, I can't remember all the names. So they, they, they categorize things into six buckets and, yeah. and those buckets are somewhat fictitious based on what you tell the program to look for. You give it a, a value as to how many populations you think are there and it spits out. It's like a consultant that tells you what time it is. You, you know, I exactly. think there's six populations. It gives you a pretty picture with six populations. But, but anyway, they use that data to cherry pick um, 99 samples are going to do whole genome sequencing on. Um, so when they say they're not using the galaxy to do the breeding program, I think that project right there begins to blur that line. You're, you're using the, the, the galaxy to figure out what to sequence to really extreme depth to start your breeding program. Yeah. Uh, and that to me looks as if it is utilizing the data for the breeding program. And that's, 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 that's been pu publicly presented. They also have publicly presented that they're looking for the BTBD allele, the, the, the CBD allele. Um, which is already out there. I mean, Seth Crawford's already bought it and used our kit. We have, a, we have a marker that tracks that, and we didn't turn that into a breeding operation. We turned that into a kit that anyone could buy and, and, and any breeder could use. Uh, and he's done it successfully. I wouldn't know how to do it successfully because I don't know how to breed. But um, uh, he's managed to know I, if I can track the, the, which samples do not have any CBD alleles, and I'd start with type 3 plants, and they're all CBD negative, Mm -hmm. That means they're probably type four or type five. Yeah. They're one of those two. And uh, he was able to figure that out with the orange photonics that it was in fact a type, a type four. 
uh, and, and move on with it. So, um, but nevertheless, they're picking samples. I don't know where they got the samples. That's a question I can't answer. They have them listed in some of these presentations. They may have got, they may have sourced them from dispensaries, you know, I don't know, but um, yeah. uh, they're, they're clearly hunting for markers for the breeding program. And it, it looks as if it's being guided by um, their historical data. Here's, here's, here's a good one. And I know you briefly touched on it and you can choose to answer it or not because it is kind of a, a, a personal opinion question. Um, it, it's referring to what Bodhi asked the other night about uh, Chimera. Um, okay. Some data on Chimera because I know a lot of us, like I grew up, I grew up like that was Chimera, uh, Watson and Clark were the end all be all when it came to breeding. And slowly over the years, you learn things and you realize, fuck, they may not be who I, who I hope they would be. So I, I, I have to say the first three people that contacted me after we put ChemDog public in uh, 2011 were those three people in that exact order. Yep. Uh, and I met, and I met uh, Robert Clark and Dave Watson, who were you know, nice enough to host me over there in, in Amsterdam uh, and show me around. Um, we never came to any agreement on, on I, I think they wanted to do something like Phylos back then, but we weren't funded and it was early. It was the, the laws in the United States weren't really favorable at that time. So we yeah. kind of put MGC on ice for a little bit while we waited for the coal memo to get, um, you know, more clarity on it. But um, so I spent a lot of time with Ryan Lee at a lot of the ICRS meetings and I've had a great time with him in person. I, I, I think I'm an asshole online. I think that's what it comes down to. And, and I just pissed him off online and he's black <laughs> face, but uh, he's, uh, he is one of the people that convinced me um, to back off on Phylos. In fact, he got me to apologize to them at an Emerald Cup a couple of years ago for calling them out on this. And so in 2016, there's a lot of news on our Facebook site. And arguably back then it was not as, we didn't have the videos you have now. We yeah. had information um, from people. Well, I, I had the history of, of, being, of seeing genomic companies get built. This is what always happens. So I was naturally suspicious. Uh, and then I saw that they weren't putting any data public, but telling everybody that they were saving them from Monsanto by putting a star on the galaxy. A star on the yeah. galaxy doesn't give you any prior art. The USPTO can't do shit with that. Yeah. Uh, they, if you look at the patents they issue, they talk about the BTPD allele, which is a genotype, and they talk about chemotypes. Those are the two languages the USPTO uses to evaluate strains right now. It might change, it might get broader in the future, but the, the precedence that's been set with the biotech LLC patent is that you need a genotype and a, and a, and a chemotype for, you, for us to understand what it is you have. Um, there's some lawyers that may have better information on this than me. Reggie might be a good person or Dale Hunt might be a good person to talk to on this because they're, they're, they're more versed in, the, in some of the, what's allowable there. But um, so we, we made a noise and we probably weren't polite about it. And uh, a bunch of p people kind of yelled at us about it and convinced us to kind of shut up. You're, you're being a bad community member here. Uh, you don't have enough hard data on this and you're being paranoid. Um, and then over time, we've, we, after we apologized, I should say I apologized to Mowgli about this, I saw the behavior didn't change. They put out 845 samples uh, a couple years ago and then another two years went by and nothing else showed up. And I was like, well, I thought we came to agreement that if you're gonna be open about this, you had to be open and not yeah. use the cover of the OCP to act like you're open when you're not. Uh, and that, uh, that's what kind of triggered us to get back involved. When we saw all this go down, we're like, Oh God, we're kind of complicit in this because we were barking about it a few years ago and then we backed off and now look what's happened. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I, I don't, I don't know. I don't know what to say. I, I, I really can't, I haven't been in this space long enough to, to really weigh in on those three individuals and, and where they lay, you know, where, where they're in the cannabis space. But, you know, I, I know Ryan's had some fingerprints on, on the biotech LLC stuff. And so he's generally been totally supportive of, of patents and I'm not anti-patent either. I, I generally, I generally think they're evil, but I, I think they exist. And because yeah. they exist, if you put your head in the sand over the rules of that game, you're going to get screwed. Exactly. Uh, that's, that's totally true. Uh, totally so you got to learn it and you got to play the game at least defensively. Uh, and if you have enough money, you might be able to afford the offensive tracks. But a lot of companies many years ago were so new in the space, they couldn't afford the offensive tracks. The offensive tracks can also be 20 to 30 grand a patent. Yeah. Uh, uh, you can probably get the provisionals like chucked in for a couple grand, but a year later, 18 months later, you're gonna be held to make a decision on whether you're gonna go full bolt on this thing, and those are gonna cost you more like 20 grand. So defensive IP seemed to be the cheap way to start. And that's what yeah. we tried to enable with Canopedia was get things on blockchains, get things public. So you at least don't get submarine by somebody else. You can at least say my shit existed here 
And it's not some bullshit uh, site that might disappear. There's actually, it's, we've got something on an immutable ledger that seems to have a financial reason to exist for a long period of time. Uh, and the site's not going to go down and my prior art's not going to disappear. I think that's the biggest issue the USPTO has in the cannabis space is uh, the sites um, go down because there's all the censorship on the internet over cannabis sites. And so you can put your stuff online and find it get wiped out by Facebook or something else. And then you no longer have your prior art. So we, we need these tools that, that are immutable um, to you know, survive all the censorship that's going on. Yeah, that, and, and that's a great answer uh, about uh, Kymir. I think it was very uh, informative, you know, and, and it's just based on your opinion and, and your brief interaction. Um, He's a smart guy. He knows his stuff. I've learned a lot from no him. Doubt. I've learned yeah. a ton from him. So, you know, it's no, no, not disparaging there, but everyone gets different interests. And sometimes these, you know, these conflicts make us go different ways. Absolutely. Um, here, here we go. If plants aren't patentable, then who has the prior art? So plants are patentable, uh, unfortunately. Uh, I, I'm not saying this as a supporter of what's going on. Um, in fact, if anyone wants to watch a very good review on IP, I'd encourage people to look at um, Stephen Kinsella's work on this. He's a patent attorney who hates IP, and so he's got a very refreshing perspective. But he also is very... Um, legit about it and that look they exist and if you don't play by these rules you're, you're you know you're exposed so yeah. um you, you can be as anti-patent as you want but if you put your head in the sand you're probably going to lose so you, you have to um respect the fact that the law is there so there's a lot of different ways you can patent in fact the the best way i think that may have just emerged yesterday is um the usda just opened up its doors to take in cannabis seeds uh and that is uh, that might be the best protection I think growers can get right now because I don't think Phyllos has stabilized seeds. I, I've just got to say, they're, they're, yeah. they just turn into breeding. And to, to breed, if they get cultivars in from other people that agree to license them to them, they then need to probably cross them and change them a little bit so that they're unique. That'll take a couple cycles. And then you've got to back cross those so that they're stable. And what the USDA does is I think they want like 3,000 seeds. It's a lot of seeds. And they did check yeah. them for whether they are, in fact, stable. Yeah. pop a few and see if they're really extreme in phenotype. And if they are, they don't consider it a viable um, uh, PVP. So there is um, Plant Variety Protection Act. That's one. There is There are plant patents, which are their own class of patents, but those patents are for asexually uh, reproduced material, clones. Okay. Um, and then there are utility patents, which are the broadest patents, which are the patents that we saw Biotech LLC get. Um, and... Those can be um, very expensive to unravel. Once the patent is issued, you need to do an ex parte re-exam, which can be a couple hundred grand to try and invalidate a patent. So um, that's, that creates a different financial dynamic uh, in the field. Now, now we've, we've put some data public that, that may challenge it. It may not. Um, you know, I'm not a lawyer on that, but the Jamaican lion project we did, we did that. Uh, one, we needed a type 2 plant to sequence, and two, we tried to find something that predated the patent and, and build the best – uh, forensics back to that date. This particular strain won a cannabis cup in San Francisco in 2011 uh, and has been known to be a type 2 plant that sometimes is, is, is beta carotene dominant, sometimes myrcene dominant. Uh, and that, that's one area I think at the USPTO, um, I know Reggie's trying to help educate them and others need to educate them, is that this concept of using uh, terpenes as a fingerprint for a strain is really dangerous because it's not really a fingerprint, it's an environmental signature. Yes, uh, environmental signature. Exactly. And, and that, that means you could have the same plant and put it somewhere else and get a terpene profile, or you can have a completely different plant that's genetically distinct, has a different cannabinoid profile, but still gives you, you can tweak it to pop myrcene or pop beta care, depending on yeah. how, you, how you grow it. So I don't like those uh, as, I think those are very broad and very dangerous because uh, when you get something that says, I, have a, I, I own all type 2 plants that don't have myrcene as as a dominant terpene, you suddenly own way, way, way too much property. Big splat, yeah. And it's, uh, it, it, it's not clear to me. I know Mark does great breeding and great work, and I don't doubt that that guy can breed good stuff. It's, it's, it's more that the, the, the scope of claims, uh, it, there's, there's a ratchet effect. They always get bigger. They never get smaller. Uh, so a good lawyer is going to take that patent and try and broaden it even more and broaden it even yeah. more. Um, We've seen it get pushed back in Canada. There's a, there's a, there's a collection up there of um, probably LPs. I don't really know who's behind it, but there's a group of people up there funding uh, an opposition to the patent up there, and they managed to narrow the claims going into Canada. Um, so the claim on that patent is enforced in Canada right now, and it's, small, it's, it's, it's more narrow than it is here in the United States. All right, here's, a, here's another question. And, and also, just, just so people know, 
um, as far as as far as uh, being stable phenotypically in cannabis, that is a rare thing. IBL is very hard to apply to in cannabis. Um, it's very, there are very few strains that have less than three phenotypes, if any. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, I, it's, it's hard. I'm not surprised when I look at the variation in the genome. I mean, this is a it's a quite diverse plant. It's 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 hard to find other species that can be. It's almost it's not quite there, but it's pretty close. One snip every ninety four bases is almost like having chimpanzees and humans being able to cross and still have productive yeah. offspring. It's, it means that you get a spectrum of, of, of phenotypes and any one plant you have, uh, it's, it's rare. The, the most homozygous plants we've seen um, came from Franco. And oh, those, really? were land, those were land races, yeah. Oh, and they uh, were and, land races? Yeah. yeah, yeah. And there may be some controversy about that. We didn't source them, but I think he got them out of the Congo and there's some biopiracy concerns there that I, I'm not really... Um, attuned to but um he's he shipped us a few from there and those those things are the most homozygous things we've seen maybe those will be stable and give you you know seeds that are all near clonal but i i think until we get apo mixes worked out um we're going to be we're going to be dealing with that but i think that's coming uh, at some point someone's going to figure out how to make double haploids in cannabis and the whole thing's going to go seed well, what did you want to ask Okay, here's one. Regarding defensive IP, do you believe open source breeding is practical, affordable, and common standard for small breeders? So um, it depends on what's affordable. I think you'll, you, you might hear, um, you know, Dale Hunt may have a different opinion on this because you can file provisionals very cheaply, and maybe that's the right thing to do. Um, and you can decide after the term of the provisionals up to say, screw it, I'm going to go open with this. I can't afford to go any further. Um, but it really comes down to whether the USPTO is going to be effective at their job looking through the prior art. That's, and that's my concern. Having been involved in the patent system for a long time and people can call me hypocrites up and I have a lot of patents in my name from all the stuff that I've done. And my experience using the patent office is one that makes me um, very disgruntled about it because the USPTO doesn't have a financial incentive to do the preliminary search report correctly they make just as much money on the re-exams. So uh, they don't really care if they issue a broad patent. The market's going to sue over it later, and then they'll get more revenue when the re-exam happens. So the incentives there aren't right for them to do very thorough preliminary um, search reports. So you really have to kind of put it – if you're going to go and put it open, you've got to make sure it's open and, and obvious and in their face and they can't miss it. Uh, put it, you know, publish the data in multiple places so that it's found and that you have a mechanism for uh, whatever's indexing the, the internet to find it. Uh, you know, the Google has to be able to see. If you're putting this stuff up by like on the, on the IPFS, the, you know, Google doesn't crawl that and will never find it. Uh, great place to store some data, but it's not, it's not going to be found by the USPTO. Gotcha. That's, that's really fascinating. I didn't even know that. Let's see. What else do we got? Um, can I ask you, what, what's your experience with cannabis as far as uh, personal? Is this something you've been interested in prior to the genetic aspect? Or, uh, yeah, cannabis? so I got introduced to cannabis in seventh grade, a uh, long, long time ago. And then I took a big hiatus from it uh, when I got my first job. Just it was a, on the Human Genome Project. It was, it was afraid I was going to get tested and get chucked off sure. for that. So, so and I, I, I was probably away for it until... 2010 or so, a bunch of friends of ours were getting cancer in their mid 30s and 40s. And it was, everyone was like, what the hell is this? And we were, we were building DNA sequencers at the time that could sequence the tumor and sequence the patient and figure out what druggable mutation they actually had in the tumor. Yeah. The problem is they, they then would turn to a set of toolboxes like cisplatin and all, all this poison. You'd have this wonderful targeted approach of nailing the tumor at Achilles heel, but the selection of drugs you had all sucked. Um, and that's when people started forwarding me cannabinoid papers saying, well, what about these? These are safe. These are non-toxic. And that's when I really dove back in into it again. Um, and then it, every time I think we started getting cold feet about that business model, someone in our family would get sick that would benefit from it. It would re-enrage us into doing more. Uh, my father's one. My father's had type, uh, he's had stage four cancer for four years now. He's been fighting uh, and it's, it's a prostate cancer that went to the bones, it went everywhere, and the only thing that's dealt with his pain has been type 2 plants, uh, and very similar to actually what was patented. And that's one thing that kind of got me into the Jamaican Lion Project is like, look, we, this, 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 is, this is helping cancer patients really close to me. I'm not tolerating this, that someone owns this. This is something yeah. that needs to be public. And so 
Fortunately, Dash funded that, and uh, they funded it in a way where it, it went public more or less two or three days after the assembly was done. We didn't even have a chance to really look at it. We QC'd it, put it public, and we've since been combing through the data to figure out what we can learn. And I think that's the right model is get, get – we need to you know, float all boats right now. Uh, having this cartelized, everyone having their own private um, cannabis genome, that's fine. But uh, if we really want to accelerate the field – we need good references out there that everyone can utilize, even our competitors. And uh, I'm certain Phylos has probably used the Jamaican lion thing for their, making their 50K chips. I mean, th the timing of that would have been perfect for them, and that's fine. Um, the, uh, we've seen others publish off of it already. There's like someone, some group's done a, um, a cannabis proteome off of the Jamaican lion reference we put forward. So th that's in bioarchive right now. It's a really interesting read. Um, but... Uh, yeah, so my history has been uh, on and off, but uh, we've seen CBD help tremendously in, in arrhythmias as well. We have a lot of um, AFib in the family, and yeah. this actually affected my brother. And there's, a, there's actually an ICRS presentation I gave on this. Uh, his actual case was really fascinating because we sequenced the genomes of everyone in the family and figured out he has two different calcium channel mutations, one from my mother, one from my father. He's got debilitating AFib, and the only thing that nails it is CBD. Uh, and so an AFib's big. There's like 6 million people in the country with AFib. And now, I, I don't think it works on all AFib. He's got a very private, those variants aren't known to any, any other database but him. So they're very rare variants. Uh, one's in an RYR2 gene. And, uh, uh, and my sister's an electrocardiologist, and she was afraid to basically ablate it. She's like, I, don't, I can't map this arrhythmia. I don't, I don't, I don't want to burn it. Uh, you're going to have to do something else. And so um, CBD came to the rescue for him. So there's been this consistent... Um, theme in our family where this plant keeps pulling us back. Wow. I wish you were in my family because uh, we've had some cancer things go on and no one was able yeah. to have anything. That's, that's oh, you know, the, the craziest amazing. thing about my father's story is uh, his, uh, I didn't recognize this or put the, put two and two together on this until we were, um, we were flying him back into like a hospice care scenario. And uh, uh you know, all the nurses are constantly asking, what's his birthday? What's his birthday? And I kept telling them, well, it's October 1st, 1937, October 1st, 1937. And, and I'm like, what the hell? I know that date. What the hell is that date from? You know, that, that's, that's the date they made cannabis illegal. Oh, wow. He was born on that day. <laughs> so <laughs> it was like, I don't know. It's weird cosmic shit like that that makes yes. you go, all right, I think I have to keep doing this. Absolutely. I think that's I think that's awesome that you actually have a, a personal connection with it. That's that's lacking. That's it's seriously lacking in any kind of corporate world or testing world. And that's yeah, well, that's just what motivated us to do CanMed. Um, you know, we run that conference every year, and uh, it's it, we have CME credits there because our interest was like we need more doctors. When we when we initially got in this field, it was hard to find a doctor that would certify him. Uh, you know, we, you know, we're in Massachusetts and we're way behind. Right. And yeah. he lives in New Hampshire. It's even, you know, live free and die is what I call it now. Uh, it, it's one of these states where their, 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 their cannabis regs are way behind everybody else. And so he had to have two doctors sign off and he had to know them for like three to six months or something like that in New Hampshire for him to get cannabis in, 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 uh, in New Hampshire. And we were like, that's crazy. And yeah. we, we, we figured out something in, where a main certificate would work in New Hampshire and, and, uh, it's a big runaround for someone who's got stage four cancer to be like, Oh, you got to wait. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, you know, no, I'm not going to wait. So, um, yeah, that, so the CanMed helps get more doctors uh, certified, and also uh, we try to get everyone uh, to present down there. And, and uh, it's all science-based. I mean, we invite Mark there. Mark, Mark Lewis does great work. Even though we don't agree with his patents, we believe he does great science. And so uh, we welcome him in to, to present what he's doing. Uh, I'd welcome Ryan Lee, too, if he has work to present. Uh, it's all about if you present good work, we try to keep the politics and the business conflicts out of it. Um, we're, we're running out of time. But that went really fast, and, and honestly, I thank you. You, you came like at, at a at a really odd time in the business where you know all this just happened and snowballed, and it took some big nuts to come and just you know take questions, firing them at you, and and, and we all well, appreciate I, it. I I want to thank everyone online that's chipped in on this because it is hard. Uh, these folks do have a lot of money, and they could get litigious over over you know calling this stuff out, but. Uh, you know, it's, it's stronger when everyone can share data and see what's, what the truth really is. It's, it's really hard if you're just one voice and, uh, and you know, you, you, don't, you don't want to bank your entire reputation on it unless you see other people seeing, uh, you know, they can corroborate the data. And it looks like other people did that. They really, yeah. they really did their homework on this and, and figured out what was going on to a much higher degree than we did. So uh, that's very helpful. Well, I appreciate you. Um, we're probably going to put this on YouTube if that's okay. 
yeah, that's fine. This, so it's uh, got a permanent home so people can see this. Um, but yeah, thank you so much. And, and, and if you have time in the future, I'd love to have you back on. I know like this is a lot of data to throw at people. So I know people are going to be watching this, rewatching this and have more questions later. So yeah. I mean, yeah. We get the discussion going. I'm still really intrigued on where this goes, whether it goes open or closed and, and what, what's this is all going to turn into because I don't think we have clear answers, but we're, we're a tool provider. I, I don't think we necessarily need them. We just need to be transparent and make sure people understand uh, um, what we do with people's data. Yeah, I think that's the most important thing is transparency. That's all people ask, really. Yeah. To be straightforward and honest, and it's not that hard. Yeah, no, it's amazing, actually. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's much harder to actually be a liar because it's too hard. You trip up on yourself. Yep. And, yeah, and, exactly. And uh, truth, truth makes it really easy. You don't have to remember anything. Exactly. Well, thank you yeah. so much, brother. I hope you have a wonderful all right. night. Cheers. Thank you. Take Cheers. care. Thank you. All right, you guys. Um, I'm sorry if I didn't get to everyone's questions. I'm going to have him back on if he'll come back on. Um, there was a lot of data there. Um, it was a lot of heavy science, a lot of stuff I, I'm even trying to process right now. You know, I mean, it, it was hard science, so I'm going to have to go research a bunch of this stuff. But it does take a lot of nuts um, to come on here and uh, be face to face with someone like me that's going to not pull any punches, per se. So I, I appreciate him doing that. Um, you know, go go research, go research everything that he said. Go look it up. If you if you find something incorrect, let me know. We'll 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 bring it to him. Um, and I think the fact that he's made himself so available that that's a big step. Um, it's hard to trust people that are uh, cannabis outsiders. And I think uh, it looks like at least it appears that his heart is in the right place. So that's that's uh, important. Anyway, um, I think I think someone recorded this. Um, I hope someone recorded this. Um, if you did, I think Flabnil is going to record this. Uh, send me the link when you get it up, and I'll, I'll put it up on uh, the YouTube as well, on the YouTubes. And, um, yep, that's it. Cheers.